morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship on this Sunday. Uh, the rain cleared out for us, which is great. Uh, leaves us with almost perfect weather to be gathered out here for worship today. It's great to have all of you here. Uh, and it's great to have all of you here as we gather for what the uh, wider ELCA celebrates as God's Work, Our Hands Sunday. A day for the church to come together in acts of service for their neighbor, uh, to share the love of God and uh, work for the benefit of those in need around them. Uh, what we are doing today is we are uh, tying off these uh, no-sew fleece blankets that have already been prepared for you. Uh, and if, once you work your way all around the edge, tying off the knots, uh, you can leave them here and we'll take all of the completed blankets to the National Youth Advocate Program here in Versailles uh, so that they can uh, pass them on to the foster kids who come through their system. We gather together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by Christ's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. reading is from the 50th chapter of Genesis. Realizing that their father Jacob was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. 
Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm number 103, verses 1 through 13 which you can find on page 274, or 264, excuse me, in your hymnal. And we will read these verses responsively by whole verse, and I will read the even-numbered verses along with you for the sake of the recording. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives you all your sins and heals all your infirmities. He redeems your life from the grave and crowns you with mercy and loving kindness. He satisfies you with good things, and your youth is renewed like an eagle's. It executes righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy great upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. As a father cares for his children, so does the Lord care for those who fear him. Our second reading is from the 14th chapter of Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. 
If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing the gospel acclamation together. According to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated and we invite the younger members who are with us today to come forward and gather in uh, this area over here at this time. All right, well, it's great that we're outside for today because I can actually use this example and you can see just what I mean by it, okay? 
Now, are you familiar with uh, the directions you see on a compass? North, south, east, and west? No? Okay. So we're going all the way to the basics. Got it. So when we're trying to tell people directions, you know, sometimes if it's just in sight, you can just say, oh, go that way for a bit and then turn right or turn left. Or go that way and turn right or turn left at this spot. But sometimes when we can't see where we're going, where we're going a little bit further, then we have to have some sort of standard by which we can tell people which way to go. And so we came up with something called a compass that has a way of pointing in a direction uh, that we have determined to be north. You know, it's roughly pointed towards the North Pole. Yeah, and it's roughly that direction. It's probably not straight this way, but for our purposes, north is that way. And then it coordinates that south, the opposite of north, yeah, is that way. You're following me. And then you have east and west, which means east is going that way, yeah, and west is going that way. Are you with me so far? Okay, so all of you, which way is north? Yeah, north is that way. Which way is east? That way, all right. Which way is west? No, that's south. West is that way, yep. And then, all right, you just answered what, south. Which way is south? That, yeah, there. South is back that way. All right. So we have that. Our psalm referenced what were the exact words. As far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed our sins from us. Yeah. East is that way. West is that way. And there is no point this way where you can say you have reached east. East just keeps going and going and going and going. And there's no point that way where you can say that you have reached west. West just keeps going and going and going and going and going. So, does east ever meet west? You're thinking about it wrapping around the earth and meeting on the other side. But east and west are relative terms. Because if you go to that point exactly opposite from us on the earth, does east meet west right there? No, you just start up again. And east is that way, and west is that way. And we keep searching for where east and west meet together, and they never do. Because in reality for us, east and west don't wrap around the earth and meet at a point. East goes straight that way and west goes straight that way through the atmosphere into outer space and on for an indefinite period of time and just keep going and going to the edge of the universe. So when I stand here and say that the Lord forgives you all of your sins, and removes them as far as the east is from the west. We're not talking about wrapping around the earth and trying to find where east meets west on the other side. We're talking about east going off the planet into outer space to the edge of the universe, west going through the atmosphere into outer space to the edge of the universe that way. Yeah, through all those galaxies and on and on and on. When the Lord forgives us, our sin is gone. As though we are on the east edge of the galaxy and our sin is on the west edge. Not, the, not even the galaxy, of the universe. 
universe. So, we're on one edge of the universe, our sin is on the other edge of the universe, and it just keeps going away. Mm. And so what we can do is we can trust that when we confess our sins, that the Lord forgives us and removes those sins from us so that neither we nor the Lord ever see them again. Does that make sense? I mean, I know that gets into all the dynamics of space and everything else, which is of great interest to me, and I could keep talking about that. But I've got to lead the rest of the worship service. So maybe some other time we'll talk about that. But in the meantime, let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for forgiving our sins and for taking them away from us to the edge of the universe and beyond. Amen. All right, thank you. I'm going to take that as excitement for uh, God's forgiveness and you can return to your families. Thank you very much. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I've referenced this movie before, so my apologies for uh, going back to it again, but it just fits uh, with our gospel lesson today. In the 2015 animated movie Home, viewers are introduced to an alien race known as the Boob. This alien race has many customs and practices that look and feel incredibly awkward to us. And one of these awkward practices is their understanding of the limits to forgiveness. As the main character O explains, the Boove have a rule for their society. Quote, nine mistakes and you're out. Unquote. And by out, he means that you are erased. After nine mistakes, you are disappeared from the living world so that your continued mistaking, as they put it, no longer harms the larger society. Now, because the Boove have been running for their lives to escape their enemy, the Gore, this rule about nine mistakes and you're out has not been enforced. But after hitting send all on a party invitation and inadvertently giving the Gorg directions to the Boob's newest hiding spot, O's 62nd mistake will be his last. If he is caught by his species, he will be erased. So what does a limit on forgiveness look like? It looks a lot like this rule from the boo. Exceed the limit on your number of sins and we will erase you from our lives. We will cut you off from our social circles until it is though you have died and no longer exist in this world. Jewish law and tradition offered many things to say about what constituted a mistake or a sin, as well as what needed to be done for penance and restoration after a sin. This was the basis for much of the temple's system for animal sacrifice. But while there was no limit imposed by society on how many sins one could commit, there was a traditional limit on the number of times an individual had to forgive another individual. The first three times a person sinned against you, you were to forgive them when they confessed their sin and asked you for forgiveness and attempted to repair the damage they had done. The fourth time, however, you were under no obligation to forgive them. So we fast forward to the time of Jesus and his disciples, and Peter's being, been paying attention to Jesus' teachings 
and his willingness to forgive people even when the law calls for that person to be killed. So Peter thinks he's caught on to something. And he wonders if that means they should move the limit for forgiveness from three to seven. This would more than double the, the amount of forgiveness that we offer to one another and would be considered extremely generous in and around Jerusalem. And seven's a special number for them. Seven represents wholeness, completeness, even perfection. So seven would be a great number at which we can set a generous new limit for forgiveness. Right, Jesus? Well, Jesus responds with a different idea. Instead of counting how many times someone has sinned against us, let's offer forgiveness without limits every time someone confesses their sins against us. And as he tends to do, Jesus illustrates his point with a parable. He tells a story about a king whose servant has racked up a debt of 10,000 talents, the equivalent of 150,000 years of servant labor. When the king demanded that the servant either pay the debt or be sold into slavery, along with his entire family, and his entire household belongings bartered for money. The servant begged the king for additional time to pay the debt. And moved by pity, the king forgave the servant's debt and let him go. That same servant soon encountered another servant, one who owed him a debt of a hundred denarii, or one hundred days, of servant labor. The one forgiven by the king turned into the stereotype of a mob or mafia enforcer attempting to collect a debt through violence and intimidation. And when the second servant could not pay and asked for additional time to pay the debt, the first servant refused and had the second servant arrested until he could pay the debt with cash or with forced labor. The king was enraged that the first servant could be forgiven for so much and yet would not extend that forgiveness to another. We know the rest of the story, but we tend to get lost in the threat of punishment for not offering forgiveness to others and forget just how much was initially forgiven the first servant. In those days, no one person would be able to repay a debt of 10,000 talents. That total was significantly more than the total amount of taxes collected throughout Judea. It would be like one individual owing the equivalent of the entire national debt of the United States of America. And yet, the king, the symbolic representative of God, was willing to forgive that huge debt, asking only for the servant to forgive others in turn. So we are to forgive others as the Lord has forgiven us, without limits. It's that simple, right? Unfortunately, no, there is more to say. And there is more to say because the church has settled for an easy answer on too many occasions, ripping the story out of context and demanding that people who have suffered abuse and trauma forgive their abusers and their attackers without the abusers and attackers offering true confession and repentance. But we must remember that this discussion of the extent of forgiveness comes immediately after Jesus and the disciples talk about the need for confession of sins and how individuals and communities are to approach those who sin 
for the purposes of repentance and reconciliation. The discussion of the extent of forgiveness assumes that the one who sinned has confessed their sin and is looking to repair the damage done to their relationship with the other person. And so, this call for unlimited forgiveness is not a call to forgive abusers and bullies who have no intention of stopping what they are doing. In these situations, our first step as individuals and communities is not to offer forgiveness or what Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have called a cheap grace. Our first step as individuals and communities is to confront abusers and bullies until they see the true extent of the damage they are doing, confess that they are in the wrong, and begin the work of repairing the damage that they have done. Then we can talk about unlimited forgiveness. In the movie Home, O willingly concedes that he has made mistakes, mostly small errors. It is not his unwillingness to confess, but society's limit on forgiveness that puts his life at risk. In our society, we too often put limits on forgiveness. We declare that someone has violated the law too many times and does not deserve to be a free citizen anymore. Or we say that someone has offended us too much or too often, and so we cut them out of our lives, hoping to never speak to them or even see them again. Especially in this time of pandemic, and of higher stress levels for all. The Lord calls us to be different. The Lord calls us to be a society that freely confesses our sins, that works to repair the harm we cause by our sins, and a society that freely forgives those who sin against us. The Lord invites us to confess to the Lord and to one another, and repent, trusting the Lord's unlimited forgiveness. And so we pray that the Lord can give us the confidence in this unlimited forgiveness that the Lord offers to us, so that we can offer the same to those who confess their sins against us. Amen. Thank you.
as the people of God who God freely forgives and removes our sins to the edge of the universe, we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord our God, you have commanded the light to shine out of darkness, and you have again brought us to your house of prayer to praise your goodness and ask for your gifts. Accept now in your endless mercy the sacrifice of our worship and thanksgiving and grant us those requests which will be wholesome for us. Make us to be children of the light and of the day and heirs of your everlasting inheritance. Remember, O Lord, according to the multitude of your mercies, your whole church, all who join us in prayer, all our sisters and brothers, wherever they may be in your vast kingdom, who stand in need of your help and comfort. Pour out upon them the riches of your mercy, so that we, redeemed in soul and body, and steadfast in faith, may ever praise your wonderful and holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and always, through all ages of ages. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes, and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord, in your mercy. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look to you to heal, renew, and redeem your world. Lord, in your mercy, make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy, bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees fleeing famine, poverty, and war. Lord, in your mercy. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Quiet our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another, and mercy for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Whether we live or whether we die, 
we are yours. We thank you for those who have showed us faithfulness, for the knees that taught us how to bow to you and the tongues that taught us to praise you, especially Robert Bob Struby and John Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, whom we commemorate today. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. For
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We are growing in faith and sowing the love of Jesus.